one of the uh, folks at the forefront of this movement is Michael Ferris, and he's here to educate us more further on this. So before he does, let me read this very impressive intro for him. Michael Ferris is the Chancellor of Patrick Henry College and Chairman of the Homeschool Legal Defense Association. He was the founding president of each organization. Ferris graduated from Western Washington State College, magna cum laude, with bachelor's in political science, followed by a Juris Doctorate from Gonzaga University with honors. At Gonzaga, Ferris was the articles editor of the Law Review and was the winner of the Linden Cup Moot Court competition. Recently, Ferris earned an LLM in the Public International Law from the University of London. Ferris has specialized in constitutional appellate litigation. In that capacity, Ferris has argued as lead counsel before the Supreme Court of the United States, eight federal circuit courts of appeals, and in the, in the state Supreme Courts and appellate courts of 13 states. Additionally, Ferris is the author of numerous amicus briefs before the United States Supreme Court. Ferris has been a fixture on Capitol Hill for over 30 years, having testified before Congress on numerous occasions in both the House and Senate. Ferris was the co-chairman of the Coalition for the Free Exercise of Religion that successfully lobbied Congress for the passage of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. He had been a leading advocate for the sovereignty of the United States with his successful opposition to various United Nations treaties which seek to control the domestic policy of the United States. Well done. Ferris is nationally known as a pioneering leader of the modern homeschooling movement. His leadership of Homeschool Legal Defense Association has taken him to nearly every state and a growing number of other nations. As the founding president of Patrick Henry College, Ferris has helped to launch a highly regarded Christian college that is founded on a strong commitment to biblical truth and classical liberal arts, the twin pillars of the educational practices of the founding generation of the United States. At Patrick Henry College, Ferris teaches constitutional law, public international law, and has coached the Patrick Henry College moot court team for eight national championships, including each of the most recent six tournaments. <coughs> Ferris is the author of over 15 books, a number of law review and other scholarly articles, and countless articles in the popular press. He has appeared on every national television network, dozens of talk shows, and played himself in a motion picture. He is the author and narrator, narrator of a popular video series entitled Constitutional Literacy. He is the co-host of a daily radio show, Homeschool Heartbeat, played on nearly a thousand stations. Ferris's work has been recognized by a number of awards, including the Salvatore Prize for American Citizen, Citizenship from the Heritage Foundation, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Virginia Family Foundation, and or, an original inductee in the Kennewick High School Hall of Fame, and for his work in home education, Education Week magazine named him one of the top 100 faces of education for the 20th century. Mike and Vicki Ferris have 10 children and 17 grandchildren. Why don't we welcome Mr. Michael Ferris to the podium. Well, Kelly, you forgot to s tell that I used to be a notary public. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much, uh, Chairman, Chairwoman Townsend. It is great to be here, members of the committee. What an honor. Uh, I will uh, um, reserve a good amount of time for questions and answers. I, I, I find on this subject a lot of members of the legislature have heard quite a bit about Article 5 and have questions. So I, I don't want this to be purely a, a, a lecture. But since I do teach constitutional law uh, and have done so for 15 years, uh, it is natural for me to, to go into professor mode just for a little bit as an introduction. We all know that the uh, Constitution, at least is supposed to be the supreme law of the land. Um, but the supreme political power of the land is the power to make the Constitution. And the only branch of government that possesses by itself the supreme power of the land are state legislatures. <coughs> because under the path that Article 5 gives us to propose amendments through the state convention of the states process and the power to ratify those amendments, only the state legislatures can by itself or by themselves change the supreme law of the land. 
Now, why would we, why did the founders do that? The founders followed a very important principle, and it is because they viewed the nature of man as inherently sinful. No person can be trusted as the judge of the extent of their own power. They didn't want Congress being the judge of the extent of Congress's power. They didn't want the Supreme Court being the judge of the extent of judicial power. They didn't want the president being the judge of the extent of his power. And they didn't want the federal government collectively being the judge of the extent of their power, of the power of, the power of Washington, D.C., in shorthand. They wanted the states <coughs> to have the ultimate check and balance on the power of the federal government. Not one state. They'd experienced a lot of difficulty with the state of Rhode Island. They did not want one state to be able to veto the, the will of the whole nation. They, there was a lot, of, a lot written in the Federalist Papers about the ability of one state to try to cur curtail uh, important things. But they wanted to give the states collectively, through a responsible check and balance process, and in this case, two-thirds of the states, when 34 states today apply <clears throat> for a convention for particular purposes, and when 38 states ratify, two-thirds to get the discussion formally underway, three-fourths to agree to the final uh, changes, they wanted to, to be able to give the ultimate power, the supreme power of the land, to the states. Because you can't trust anybody to be the judge of their own power. And I think if any of us, you know, really regardless of what party we're in, what age we're in, any way you want to slice and dice the American people. Everyone understands Washington, D.C. has too much unchecked power. Every branch of Washington, D.C. has too much unchecked power. And much of what we think the Constitution is so much worthy of honor and perhaps even veneration has been undermined by the actual practice of the federal government, all of, almost all of which has been approved by the Supreme Court of the United States. We're spying on our own citizens in unprecedented ways. We are, uh, you know, the president is legislating by himself. And it's not just this president. This is, not, this is not a partisan observation. Republican presidents have done exactly the same thing. It's just perhaps, you know, a little more publicized, perhaps a little more often. But, but the, the extent of the power, it's, it's Republicans and Democrats alike have decided that the president alone should be able to make law, despite the fact that Article I, Section 1 of the Constitution says all legislative authority is vested in the Congress of the United States. The only people with the power to make law are the people's elected representatives in the legislature, not the bureaucracy, not the president, not the Supreme Court, certainly not the United Nations. It's the people's elected legislative representatives. And when, we, when Congress gives away that power by saying, the secretary shall make rules that, the secretary shall make rules that, they're not giving away their power. They're giving away the right of the people to elect the people who make the laws. Because when an agency, let's take the Environmental Protection Agency, for example, that once decided how wet wetlands have to be in order to be federally protected, their, their ruling was that when a goose flies over the land, on the wettest day of 100 years and sees its reflection in the water, it's known as the glancing goose test, then it's wet enough to be federally protected wetland. Now, no congressman would ever vote for that because they know that the political ads would, would run. You know, Congressman Jones doesn't have the sense that God gave a goose. Uh, and so they wouldn't vote for such a thing. And so they say the secretary should make rules that. They didn't give away congressional power to the EPA in that circumstance. Rather, they gave away the right of the people to vote the rascals out who made such a stupid rule. It's our rights as people to elect the people that, we, that uh, regulate our, our lives. Now, uh, Chairman Townsend's observations about federalism are really important when we understand political theory. You are elected to represent the people of your district specifically, and perhaps more broadly, the people of Arizona. That's it. No one else, the people that are run for office in, in Massachusetts, are elected to represent the people of their districts in Massachusetts, and perhaps the state of Massachusetts. And that's it. The people in Congress that are elected from Massachusetts, and the people that are elected in Congress from Illinois and California and Alaska and Florida are elected to represent the people of their states. Now, we've agreed all collectively that all those representatives together 
can make policy on certain issues, but only on those issues. And those issues are listed in the Constitution of the United States. Defense policy, foreign policy, run the post office, run the patent office. There are 28 specific enumerated powers that are given to Congress. And on those issues, the, we've all consented to have Congress, all the representatives from all over the country. The representatives from Illinois, the, we have not consented to have the congressman from Illinois to dictate the education policy for Arizona. We have not consented to having the, the senators, U.S. senators from Florida, dictate the welfare policy for the state of Arizona. We have not consented. The voters of those other states are effectively dictating to you, the representatives of the people of Arizona, what your policy will be on a whole bunch of uh, domestic issues that are not within the, the competence of the jurisdiction of the United States government. We're violating the most important rule of the Constitution of all. And that is, we get to elect the people who make the policy for us. And when, uh, when congressmen from other states can make the policy on domestic issues that the Constitution gives to this body, not to the Congress of the United States. We're violating the most fundamental principles of a Republican form of government. We're violating fundamental democracy. And it shouldn't matter what party you're a part of. We should all rise up and say, not on our watch. Arizona should get to decide Arizona's education policy. Arizona should get to decide Arizona's welfare policy. Arizona should get to decide all of the domestic issues that were not explicitly given to the Congress of the United States and the Constitution, which are very few in number, patent office and so on. They're, they're, they're not many. That's not a very big budgetary impact. You all and all state legislators alike are becoming the servants the, the efficient, uh, you know, the, the, the functionaries of the will of Congress rather than the sovereign elected representatives of the people of your district. You're, you're serving the wrong masters, but you don't have to. You don't have to. And Article 5 gives you the power to throw the rascals out, to throw Washington, D.C. out entirely and to say no more of this. And on, on this particular, I mean, it, this is just a trick of the General Welfare Clause. The General Welfare Clause was interpreted in a case called Butler versus the United States improperly uh, by a, in, in about nine lines of type on the Supreme Court's pages, <coughs> Butler versus the United States. They say, well, we've, we've listened to this founder and that founder, and for reasons we're, we're too busy to explain to you, we're, we're choosing to go with Hamilton rather than with Madison on this subject. And... Um, and so we think that the General Welfare Clause is a broad grant of, of, of authority to, to spend money. And then they followed that up with uh, Dole versus South Dakota, where they say it is constitutional to use strings attached to federal expenditures on subjects the government has no authority to spend money on, no, no enumerated authority to spend money on, to tell the states what to do. You take those two decisions together, both approved by the Supreme Court of the United States, and you turn the government entirely on its head. Now, you can, you can reverse the Supreme Court of the United States. I've helped to do it before. Um, uh, Chairman Townsend re uh, referenced the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. I'm the guy who named it. Um, I was the chairman of the group of lawyers who wrote it. And so I, I was part of a team, but I, I was a material player in that. And when the Hobby Lobby won its decision before the Supreme Court of the United States this last year, it was not based on the free exercise of religion, although it should have been based on that. It was based on the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which reversed a decision of the Supreme Court of the United States. By the way, that law passed in Congress 98 to 2 in the Senate and unanimously in the House. It was a wide bipartisan. The Democrats were in control of both houses of Congress when it passed, and President Clinton, and I was at the White House ceremony when President Clinton signed the, law and the, the act into law. So this is not a Republican or Democrat thing by any means. It, it, my co-chairman was Mark Stern, the chairman of the chief lawyer for the American Jewish Congress. We, we worked together, bipartisan, across religious lines to do that. But we were all agreed on one thing. The Supreme Court got it wrong, and we needed to reverse them. <clears throat> and so you can reverse the Supreme Court of the United States. So people say, isn't this all you know, spitting in the wind because they don't obey the Constitution anyway? How will constitutional amendments fix it? I understand and I sympathize with that, that statement, but it's not the most precise way of analyzing the problem. More precisely, what it is is this. There are two constitutions in this country. 
There's the Constitution as written, and then there's the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court. And they're wildly divergent in most of the time. And the Supreme Court gets it right like a broken clock, you know, for about one second, twice a day. Uh, and so, um, but other than that, there's so many instances where the Supreme Court has not followed the original intent of the Constitution on the General Welfare Clause, on the Commerce Clause, on the extent of executive power, on the use of international law to control the domestic policy of the United States. And we can change all of those things with properly written amendments. How do we do it? We do it when 34 states say we want a convention of the states for that purpose. The, convention, the application that this House passed last year and three other states completely passed last year, Georgia, Florida, and Alaska. Um, by the way, the Alabama House passed it also last year, ran out of time in, the, in their legislative session to get it through the Senate. Uh, we, are, we have currently, in round numbers, it's changing every hour, um, but about 30 states, ha we have prime sponsors lined up to, to do this in 30 states this year. Uh, we hope to get to 34 states this year. I won't be terribly surprised if it's n another year, but we don't believe there's a lot of time for this country. We, need, we think that liberty's at stake, and, and, and the question isn't what the policy should be. This is not about policy. This is about structure of government. Who makes the decision? This is not, is Common Core a good idea or a bad idea? This is about who makes the education decisions. Should the states make the education decisions or the federal government make the education decision? This is not what's the right welfare policy, what's the right medical insurance policy. No, it's about who makes those decisions. Does the state make those decisions or does the federal government make those decisions? Those are the things that are at stake here. And so regardless of what we all think the policy issues are, the, the outcome should be, I think most of us can agree that most domestic policy issues are better made locally at home where the people can see them, where we get a look at them, rather than having the confusing duplicative layer of regulations on a whole range of domestic issues, both education and welfare and business and environmental, all kinds of issues would be better done by a single branch of government and that branch would be the states. Um, a friend of mine, Rob Nadelson, said, uh, what would government be like if the um, President of the United States never in, a, in the history of the office had ever vetoed any legislation, ever. Well, what you'd see is you'd see a runaway Congress with no sense of, of restraint. And the, the, uh, the other hypothetical is, what would it be like if the U.S. Senate transformed itself to be like the House of Lords and essentially approved every single thing that the House put forward? What, what, you know, you'd see absolute dominance by the House of Representatives. You'd see an imbalanced government. And they said, what would it be like if the states never used their power under Article 5 to rein in the abuses of power by the federal government? Well, what we are looking at today is exactly what it would look like because the states have never effectively do done this. 400 times in our history, round numbers, the states have filed applications for an Article 5 convention for various purposes. We've never had one because we've never had agreement on the subject matter. Agreement on the subject matter is a 225 round numbers year legislative precedent as a, the sine qua non um, for launching, for having a convention. When 34 states call a convention for a particular purpose, Congress has no choice. It is a mandatory duty for them to do that. Um, I litigated the, one of the last major Article 5 cases in this country. It was in the late 1970s. I was, uh, I'm coming up this summer on my 39th year of practicing law, <clears throat> which is hard when I'm only 41. Um, but uh, the, um, am I under oath? Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I'm 63, just in case anybody is wondering. But the, uh, uh, one of the earliest cases I did was I represented four Washington state legislators uh, in an Article 5 challenge when Congress tried to change the rules for the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. It was originally seven years. They tried to advance it by another three and a half years. And the question was, did Congress have the power to do that? And the federal court ruled Congress does not have the power to change the rules in the middle of the street. That rule is one of the big rules of Article 5. When the states call a convention for a particular purpose. You can't change the rules in the middle of the stream. Nobody can change the rules in the middle of the stream. States can't do it. The convention can't do it. No one can do it. It's been litigated. I helped litigate the case. I was the lead counsel for one of the three states. By the way, the other two states that were involved in the case were Arizona and Idaho. 
And so we worked together as a team to get that done. Um, so the, the purposes that we're calling for a convention are this, to limit the power and jurisdiction, excuse me, to impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, and then impose term limits on federal officials. I'll just briefly mention that last one. My primary objective is to see that we have term limits on the federal judiciary. I'm per, I think that term limits on Congress is a worthy discussion, but I'm less concerned about that because the voters have the ability to throw the rascals out. We have no checks and balances on the judiciary, none. The Supreme Court itself has said 30 times, the only check on our power is our own internal sense of self-restraint. We've got to do better than that. The founders wanted to be, have realistic checks and balances. We need to deliver it on that. And so, um, so we can have that discussion. So those are the, th the subjects which uh, we're asking this uh, uh, legislature, this committee first, and then the legislature to consider and to pass uh, one, this House pass once again, and hopefully we'll get it through the, the Senate this time. Um, uh, we have hopes and belief that that is going to happen. And so the... Uh, um, to add Arizona to the, to the growing number, and we believe we're going to get to 34 either this year or next year, and have a convention where we can have a, a discussion with authority. People are tired of just talking about this stuff. We want to get together with the authority to do something about it. And when it comes back, when the, let's say there's seven amendments that are proposed. They come back like the Bill of Rights. You vote them up and down individually. Uh, if you like the balanced budget amendment that comes out, you vote for it. If you don't like the term limits on Congress that comes out, you vote against it. And so when 38 states approve the particulars of the amendments, then they're a part of the Constitution. But the, so the issue before the legislature today is, should the states get together and have a discussion with the authority to do something about it? That's the issue before us, and I think the answer is self-evident, yes. We need to have this discussion with authority, and let's get this done. So with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions that any of you have. Members, are there any questions for Michael Ferris? Representative Mitchell, and Representative Mitchell, will you please introduce yourself briefly? Uh, sure, thank you, uh, Chairwoman. I was late getting here because I was another committee. So I'm Darren Mitchell from District 13. I serve as Chairman of Ways and Means, Vice Chairman of Ag and Water, and I'm really happy to be on this committee. And to see you again, Mr. Ferris. I just have a quick question. I'm a, a supporter of, of this, but could you give us a short answer for those that we're talking to who feel somehow this could turn into a runaway convention. So how do we, how do we convince others that otherwise we think might be with us of how that won't happen? I have two branches of my answer. The first branch is most people who think that this could be a runaway uh, have been taught uh, that the, uh, the Constitution itself was the result of an illegal runaway convention. <clears throat> And that's just not true, even though it's very problem. In fact, my, my son, uh, who's a senior at the University of Virginia, called me yesterday and read me a little piece out of his government textbook where they said that exact thing. And, and he said, uh, I'm going to go back and show the professor the other. But uh, on our website, conventionofthestates.com, there's a two-page you know, article that I wrote that gives you the real history of that. And... It, it wasn't a runaway convention. The states called the convention. They told the convention to render the federal constitution adequate for the exigencies of the union. The idea it was only supposed to be to the amending of the articles was a resolution of endorsement passed by Congress after seven states had already called the convention and named their delegates. It wasn't controlling. It wasn't binding. Federalist 40, Madison lays this all out and tells you the truth about how it happened. The states called the convention. The, they obeyed their instructions. It wasn't a runaway. Answer two, what are the checks and balances in the system? The big one is 38 states have to approve. 38 states have to approve. But there are all kinds of other, uh, other checks and balances. I've already litigated one of those checks and balances. We have a, have a federal court precedent. It's not binding because it wasn't from the Supreme Court, but it's still persuasive that you can't change the rules in the middle of the stream. And so uh, we would litigate again. The states have complete control, the state legislatures, to be more precise, have complete control over the delegates. You can give your delegates instructions. If they violate those instructions, you can withdraw your delegates. Uh, you have inherent power to do that. You, you can also pass legislative rules or measures to make sure of that, to put an you know, exclamation point on Even if you don't, though, you have the inherent power to do it. And uh, um, states vote one at a time, or you know, one state, one vote. 
My recommendation to states is they send seven or nine representatives. So if one guy flakes off, so what? You still got eight people, if you've sent nine, that will vote the will of Arizona. And the one flake from your state can't combine with a flake from Mississippi because it doesn't matter. You, you, don't, you don't count up dissenting votes. It's just one state, one vote. So there, there are numerous checks and balances in the process. I like to tell people that the chances of the convention running away and getting away with it are exactly the same chances of President Obama appointing me the next vacancy of the Supreme Court. Mm. I am fully qualified to be on the Supreme Court mm -hmm. of the United States. Uh, because I'm a human being. That's the only qualification in the Constitution. Uh, but I, realistically, I'm qualified. But it's not going to happen. Nobody's walking around saying, oh, you know, Mike Ferris is going to be appointed to the Supreme Court. Let's shut the Supreme Court down. Um, we, we, re, political realism tells us there is no possibility of a runaway. And to that point, yes, um, Mr. Ferris and Representative Mitchell, any, quote, runaway amendment that perhaps, let's just say, let's repeal the, the Second Amendment or change the first. Um, that can be proposed today in Congress. Congress could propose that amendment and say, we're going to push this forward. Now, obviously, they're not going to, but uh, they could put that forward. And it would require three quarters of the states, 38 states, to ratify that. And we know by the makeup of our states that would not happen. And uh, the, the reason they're not doing these crazy amendments is because they know they don't have the 38 states. So the, what we're afraid of happening at the Convention of States could happen today in our Congress, and it's not happening because it's not realistic. We're not going to be ratified. So, it, you know, it, yeah, it sounds scary, but it still has to get past the 38, and it's just not going to happen. And that's why they're not doing it, in my opinion, in Congress. I, I agree with you entirely. I, um Representative Townsend, uh, I would just, as a side note on the Second Amendment, I, I am on the uh, Education Committee of the NRA, and um, one, of the, one of the members of our legal advisory board is <coughs> Charles Chuck Cooper, uh, who is the outside counsel for the NRA and represents him in the Supreme Court of the United States. If he thought that there was any chance whatsoever that the Second Amendment was at risk, you wouldn't see the lead outside counsel for the NRA as one of our endorsers. Mm -hmm. He was, by the way, the... Uh, number three guy in the Reagan Justice Department as the head of the Office of Legal Policy. So, you know, there are outstanding legal, conservative legal scholars that just simply say this runaway um, business is, is just not valid. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Madam Chairman, to, to that point, I just, uh, I guess I was looking for a silver bullet because, and it might just be education. We have, obviously, I, I agree with you and, and I've been a supporter, but there are a few of us that we need to change their minds. And so I, I think that there's really not a, I mean, everything that you went over is, is, is right, but I guess it's just a matter of being able to convince a few people that, that should agree with us that it, it just isn't going to happen. And I, I don't, there's not really a silver bullet, I guess. No, the, the silver bullet really is, three, well, I don't think, you're right, there's not a silver bullet, but there are three elements of a, a short, there's common sense, political common sense. There's the text of the Constitution. And there's the observation that, that this, the founders gave us this. If we are constitutionalists, if we really believe in the Constitution, why are we afraid of the very process they gave us for the purpose that is so needed? We need to check the abuse of power by the federal government. And this is the process they gave us. You know, we, I don't see how people think that their constitutionalists are afraid of the very solution the founders gave us. Okay, Representative Thorpe. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for your testimony today, and I, I know you traveled some distance to be here, and I, I appreciate that, Mr. Ferris. <clears throat> um, you said one thing that I, I, I don't think I've heard this argument before, and I really appreciate it, and I kind of summed it up with no taxation without representation. Yeah, you know, our, our uh, uh, during the uh, Revolutionary War, that was uh, one of the cries that went out, and uh, that's pretty much what we have right now. And, and I, I loved, really enjoyed, you know, I, you know you're, you're being here and, and, and talking about this was really meaningful for me. The, the notion that if, um, if we had people in Washington, D.C. that were from other states, they were not elected by Arizona, and they are going outside the enumerated powers that have been provided to them in the Constitution, and they're passing laws, education, environmental protections, you name it, um, 
they are basically placing laws and burdens upon us, and we have no recourse on those individuals. We have no way to unelect a representative from uh, a congressman or a senator from um, Illinois or Massachusetts or what have you. Um, and so uh, in that scenario, you know, whether you're talking taxation or what, we have no representation, and we're being burdened with rules and laws and things like that and very little limited recourse unless uh, we take um, and use our Article 5 ability. I appreciate that very much. <clears throat> um, Representative um, Mitchell, uh, <clears throat> I think I understand your question <clears throat> with regard to, you know, is there a silver bullet, is there a guarantee? And a couple things. One is I have a, a Delegate Limitations Act which all, that I'm running that basically it, uh, any delegate that Arizona sends to a convention is sworn to take an oath to uphold the wishes of the state of Arizona. And if they don't, they're immediately recalled, replaced, and can even face civil penalties if, if they are violating the wishes of the, of the legislature. Um, the um, one thing uh, yeah, I, I like to talk about is um, I fear a runaway Congress much more than I fear a hypothesized runaway convention because there's never been, you know, to Mr. Nadelson's research, there's never been a runaway convention. Um, the one that I think is the most telling is the Washington Convention of 1861, I believe, uh, where uh, Virginia called the convention. They met in Washington, and they and their uh, mandate was to try to keep the Civil War from occurring. And for approximately two weeks, they met. Uh, I'm sure there was lots of passion there, uh, with the country possibly spiraling into a um, civil war. And yet, it was a very orderly convention. You can read the notes, the daily notes of that convention. Um, so I, I think it's really important to remember that, that we have this convention history. Matter of fact, it's been suggested that Article 5 is as sparse it is, as it is because um, conventions were so well-practiced and well-known uh, as we entered the um, Philadelphia Convention. Uh, uh, I believe there was at least 14 conventions leading up to Philadelphia. So um, I, I feel very confident that uh, we can enter into this convention, and, and I think that, that uh, Congress is very afraid of us doing it. We, we could easily see that in uh, the 1980s when they stepped in and, and, uh, and took over the balanced budget uh, amendment uh, uh, proposal idea and really thwarted uh, the states from continuing down that, that road. So uh, I, I, you know, last but not least, I just really wanted to uh, uh, tell you how much I appreciate your efforts and and um, and encourage you to continue on. And uh, I'm a uh, I'll be working with uh, Representative Townsend uh, to try to make Convention of the States happen as well as my own balanced budget amendment bill. Thank you so much, Representative Thorpe. If I could just uh, r respond in two quick ways. One through the, is through the chair. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, May I respond to him? To yes, and, and we'd just like to start uh, right off the bat with good, good uh, protocol. So Absolutely. Thank through you. the chair. Yeah. Um, um, relative to your, your Delegate Limitation Act, to show you how effective those things can be, um, the Delaware delegates to the Constitutional Convention were told you can't vote for a, uh, a proposal that denies e every state equal sovereignty. And because they were given that instruction, they were the the founders were faced with the, with the need to create what the U.S. Senate in the way that it was done, and so Delaware was the first state to ratify the Constitution. But it was the it was the fidelity of the Delaware delegates to their instructions from their state legislature that led to the one state one vote rule in the U.S. Senate, and so s instructions from states can be very powerful indeed. There's a, a very important historical basis for that. <clears throat> As to your uh, point about no taxation without representation. Not only is Arizona not being represented in the votes of Congress, the next generation for the whole country is being taxed without their consent, without being able to do anything about it, by this, this generational jumping debt. And we need to take into account the, the kids and the grandkids and the people yet unborn who are being taxed by today's spending. Members, any other questions? Representative Finch. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Um, and to um, 
Mem Member Mitchell's point, the, the silver bullet, the education probably is the, the single most important thing that we can do. And, and I too want to commend you and, and thank you for coming. Uh, it was a pleasure to hear you and Mr. Adelson in Washington, D.C. discuss this, this very matter. Um, it occurs to me in Federalist 46, Mr. Madison is talking about uh, the powerful path uh, to block the enforcement of federal acts. And, and I think that, in my understanding, sir, limited as it may be, uh, I think he was speaking to the fact that the people predated the Constitution, that the people ceded a small bit of power to the federal, well, to the states, and then, of course, they directed the states to do that uh, to the federal government. Um, I have long been a supporter of the, the Convention of States movement. Um, I'm, I'm torn. Uh, I know that Mr. Dranius is, is doing some fine work on uh, a very specific piece, uh, but I, uh, I wonder if you might be able to give us just a couple of very brief comments. I'm sure that we're going to hear lots about this in the, in the, in the coming days. But um, is, am I correct in my understanding that the Convention of States work is a broader scale than what uh, the Article 5 folks in this Geranius are, are up to? Yes, Madam Chairman. Um, the, um, <clears throat> there are three major um, Article 5 efforts underway. Um, uh, the Balanced Budget Amendment, the Compact for America with Mr. Geranius, and ours. Um, there is no reason at all, no legal reason, no political reason, that a state cannot not adopt all three. Um, and so uh, they, they have different approaches and they serve different purposes. Uh, the balanced budget amendment and the Compact for America intend to serve the same purpose, but there are different mechanics and different strategies. There's, there the, the disagreement is a, di a disagreement about tactics, but it's not an in opposition. They're both running it on basically whichever one works, they're go that's what they're going to go with. Uh, and so uh, there's, there's no reason. Ours is the only one that's aimed at really the purpose of this committee, and that is achieving mm -hmm. true federalism. Um, and so a balanced budget, that's a good thing. We're for, you know, balanced budget is included in what we're doing, and so, but it's not the only thing we're doing. Our, our, our principal aim is to reinstitute, reinstitute true federalism in this country. Madam Chair, just to, to finish Proceed. with my point, um, I'm, thank you so much for raising the issue uh, to our members here and, and hopefully to our members on the floor eventually that we are rapidly becoming nothing more than a ceremonial body, that uh, Congress is doing those bad acts that I think Mr. Madison referred to, and, and it is our responsibility uh, to assert the Tenth Amendment vigorously and regularly uh, to hold the other sovereign sphere in check. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your work. And to that point, uh, did you have a response? Okay. Well, uh, if I'm, yeah, sure. I always have a response. Um, <laughs> Article 5 is the mechanism by which we enforce the Tenth Amendment. Thank you. And, and to that point as well, um, I spent a, a great deal of time studying um, something that happened to a country not so long ago in the 90s, um, former Yugoslavia. And from my understanding, what I've learned is uh, they were a republic of six states, like we were uh, a republic of 50. And um, they, uh, they were under communism, however, but they had one ruler and his name was, his last name was Tito. And I believe Tito died in 1980. Um, prior to that, he was able to keep the brotherhood of states together uh, fairly well. And once he died, it took about 10 years. Um, but I even asked my young son a few years ago, what do you think would happen when you have six leaders of six states and no uh, leader above them? And what would happen? And he guess right away that they would start jockeying for power. They, one of them would try to raise to the top. And basically that's what happened in, in Yugoslavia where Serbia then exercised power over the rest of Yugoslavia and um, became the federal um, entity over them and their rights were then uh, ignored. And uh, what ended up happening in the end 
was um, Slovenia and Croatia seceded. And then the entire country fell. Yugoslavia dissolved. The the six states, um, you know, some some of them. There was a religious aspect to it. There was uh, Muslims versus the Eastern Orth Eastern Orthodox. I see you shaking your head like you know the history as well. It became when when the rights of the individual states were ignored, and this federalism of of one particular. The, they had the stronger armor. They had more equipment, whatever, and they exercised their power over the people and against the will of the people. The end result was disillusion. This the, it dissolved, and uh, I think that uh, I think Representative Fincham mentioned that we're just becoming a. a, a how did you term us? A Madam Chair, a, a ceremonial body. A ceremonial body to where we come here and we may make laws that eventually get overturned by the courts, by rogue judges that aren't um, acknowledging the sovereignty of the state of Arizona on things that are not enumerated powers in education, for example. And so I just want to encourage us to remember what's happened in the past in other countries and, and to not go the way of uh, a centralized government where the people's voice is no longer heard, where our constitutional form of government is ignored, and where the rule of law means nothing anymore <coughs> because it doesn't benefit those who have the power. So in my opinion, this is a, a very strong method of, of regaining that power. It's going to take some courage. I know there's some folks that are a little bit nervous about it. But unless we do something, if we don't do this and the other things that we have within our power, we are looking at repeating history. And I do not want to see that for my country. So Mr. Ferris, I thank you for coming. And thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. It's an amazing story, the things that you've done for this country. Thank you so much. It's my honor to be here. Thank you. And I just uh, had a request uh, from our vice chair. Go ahead. Dr. Ferris, not yet. Come on up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm kind of more into the mechanics of this thing, and I have a couple specific questions. And uh, the first one has to do with the ratification with process, if it comes back to the states, does the executive of the state have any power or portion to play to approve what the legislature has done? Um, Madam Chairman, uh, Mr. Campbell, the uh, uh, governor never plays a role in any phase of Article 5. Okay. Neither does the President of the United States. Right. Uh, Congress has a role in certain circumstances. The legislatures have a role in certain circumstances. But the executives of neither branch are ever relevant. And then uh, the next uh, question, the specifics of the article, the amendments being proposed, would that would all be, could be all thrashed out in convention from the several states because it's not necessary for each state to go to the convention with a defined amendment in hand. I mean, that could be the robust debate could take place at the convention. Is that correct? Madam Chairman, Mr. Campbell, uh, that's exactly correct. And it's, it's best that way. Because you want to draft an amendment that, that mm -hmm. ha, a, both is wise and is politically viable. And when you have all 50 states there and you, that debate goes back and forth, they go, you, you can find that if you change this one word here that people were willing to change, you get seven more states that will be real, willing to ratify. That's the kind of give and take that will take place at the convention. And my last question is uh, specifically, where do you see the attacks being made against the convention uh, for example, uh, lawsuits uh, claiming, I, I mean, you're uh, an attorney and wise in the ways of, of this, and, and you obviously have thought how they're going to try to not let this happen. Could you briefly discuss that? Madam Chairman, Mr. Campbell, um, uh, the, um, there, there are two different kinds of lawsuits that would be um, possible. You can file a suit about anything, but... I'm just I'm going to just throw away things that are just obviously frivolous and just talk about two the most realistic things. One is whether or not there's an aggregation issue, whether or not the 34 states really have agreed on the same subject matter. That for uh, the balanced budget amendment, uh, uh, because those have been written differently, I think th that's a fairly serious question that has to be considered. Um, I, I think that they should prevail. But nonetheless, there will be litigation over that. 
Um, for our application, however, every state that's passed it and every state that's introduced it has introduced the operative language exactly the same. And so we don't think that there's going to be any, any possibility of any successful uh, litigation on that subject. Um, <clears throat> the second phase of litigation could be uh, whether or not the, the convention obeyed the instructions that it was given. And so you know, if, for example, um, our application is, gets 34, they have a convention for that subject matter, and somebody proposes repealing the Second Amendment, I'll be the one to file the litigation myself, challenging the legitimacy of that. So, so if, if the convention goes outside of it, there, will, there, could be, there could be litigation, and I think it would be successful, based on the litigation I did on the Equal Rights Amendment. But um, uh, there's also the additional political check in addition to that. So those are the two most likely kinds. And so I don't, for our application, I don't see that litigation ever happening of a, of a serious nature because we're not going to have an aggregation issue. I'm absolutely confident we're not going to have a runaway convention. And when, when those two, two things happen, any litigation that's filed will just be frivolous. It'll be kicked out by the courts in, you know, a couple of weeks. It, it, it will not be seriously considered. Thank you, Dr. Ferris. Members, are there any other questions? Okay, well again, thank you, Dr. Ferris, thank and thank you members uh, for entertaining you. this idea, and I look forward to future robust discussion on this topic and others having to do with federalisms and states' rights. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>